We've got a savory show ahead of us as we learn how to grow beautiful herbs for the kitchen and the garden. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now in today's show, we've got something really great cooking up for you. It's all about fresh herbs. I have to say, putting together a show like this is really difficult because there's so many herbs to choose from and we have limited time to talk about them. You know, many herbs get their start in the greenhouse, so why don't we head that way and take a look? Of course, there's several ways to grow herbs. You can go to the garden center and pick up plants like these, and we'll talk about that in a little while. The other way I like to grow them, many of them at least, is by seed. Step in the greenhouse and I'll show you how. All right, let's find a place to set these down. This is where it all happens. This is where I start lots of my little seedlings in here. Now, you may ask yourself, why would you want to start herbs inside? Well, to get a jump start on the season is one reason. It may be varieties you can't find otherwise. You may have to start them yourself. The nursery may not have them. Well, some herbs, and let's get this clear right off the top, don't really do that well starting indoors. It's better to direct sow them in the garden. What you wanna do is get the soil worked up really good. Make sure it's good and rich with lots of humus. And then you can sow things like dill, fennel, coriander, and in the summer, I even plant lots of basil directly in the ground. I don't bother planting them up in the greenhouse. By that time, it's warm enough to get them right out in the ground, sown direct. Now, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that if you're gonna grow things inside, you need to use the right potting soil. For instance, here, I use a really high quality potting soil. I put in the little peat pots or these little cell packs, okay? Now, if I'm going to grow some of the Mediterranean herbs like rosemary or thyme or lavender, what I do is I take 50% potting soil and I blend it with 50% sand. This ensures very good drainage. Now, the other thing I like to do is make sure that this blend is moist before I plant the seed. Now, you'll find that these herb seeds are tiny. So you don't want to put much soil over the top of them, just a, a light dusting of soil. Press it down and water them in, and they'll be up in no time. Most herbs need an inch of water a week. Lavender, artemisia, sage, and thyme can get by with a little less. And don't overfeed your herbs. Mixing in manure with the soil in the spring, and then a mixture of fish emulsion diluted to half strength in midsummer will provide all the extra nutrients they need. Now, if starting seedlings is a little more than you want to take on right now, you can start with some starter plants like this. You can pick them up at the nursery. And what's great is that the plant breeders have come up with some wonderful varieties of herbs for us to grow. Now, I like to use herbs in lots of different ways. For instance, earlier this year, I got some curly parsley. Just look at it now, isn't it gorgeous? What I've done is I've used it as a border in this part of the vegetable garden. I use both curly parsley and flat leaf Italian the same way. It makes a great border and it performs so well in the cool early spring and late winter. Now, what's great about parsley is that it's been used for a long time. In fact, the Greeks and Romans used to use it to help settle the upset stomach. For modern man, we tend to use it for garnish on a plate of food. But I will say it has a quality about it that will actually help improve your breath. Perhaps that's the reason they place parsley on a plate in fancy restaurants. Now, whether you like seeing parsley on your plate or not, it's gorgeous in containers. One of my favorite container combinations for spring has been this buttery yellow tulip emerging from a bed of curly parsley. Now, that's a delicious combination. Now, I promise you, if you'll grow some herbs, it'll be one of the most enjoyable experiences you've ever had. It's really satisfying. And after all, the nurseries are doing most of the work by getting plants started. All you have to do is get the soil right, which really isn't that difficult because you see, most herbs will thrive in not so rich soil. As a matter of fact, if you want the essential oils, that's the part that really smells good, to come through, 
don't fertilize them too much. The other thing about herbs is that many of them need full sun, so keep that in mind. Not all of them, but most of them do. And there are a few that I would consider thugs, like mint. Beware, it will take over your entire garden. Some ways to get around this is to plant it in containers. I love clustering pots together to make a small herb garden. Or plant mint into a plastic nursery pot and bury it into the garden. This way you can control the spread. Okay, I admit it, I'm a hopeless multitasker. I'm in the garden doing one thing, I look over, like to this espaliered gala apple tree, I pick up the pruners, I leave the herbs, and I start working on this. Well, what can I say, that's just who I am. You know, multitasking, to some people, is a lack of focus, um, and that's been described that way, and I guess I do get drawn from one thing to the next, but anyway, it is what it is. But you know, I have to admit, I think that multitasking or double duty in plants is something I really admire. Like the beauty of this espaliered apple tree, not only do you get the beauty of the form, but you get those delicious gala apples. And then of course, the herbs, the consummate multitasking double duty plant. Not only are they beautiful, they can be integrated with flowers and vegetables, and you can also bring them into the kitchen and they taste delicious. There are culinary herbs for cooking fragrant herbs for potpourris, and medicinal herbs for good health. Sometimes the practical qualities overshadow the aesthetics herbs have to offer. Their interesting forms, colorful blooms, and fragrance all add intriguing dimensions to a garden's design. Just a few examples include the striking red flowers of pineapple sage, the round lavender blooms of chives, and the tiny white flowers of creeping thyme. Now for me, growing herbs means using herbs. After all, if you've got them, why not use them? You know, one of the best ways, of course, is in cooking. And some of my favorites include basil, oregano, and thyme. Now, I want to share with you a tip that I learned some time ago. All you have to do is collect some fresh herbs, chop them, and then place a teaspoon into each slot of an ice tray, and then cover with water and freeze. You can then dump the frozen cubes into a Ziploc bag and save them for winter. The pre-measured cubes are ideal for adding to savory winter soups. Keep in mind that one tablespoon of fresh herbs equals one teaspoon of them dry. Now I love this story that my friend Tina Marie Wilcox tells about that very flavorful and useful herb, mint. Tina said, well let me just let Tina tell you. The mint is planted by the cabin door because, you know, in a log cabin deep in an Ozark holler, you didn't have much company. So you keep the mint by the front stoop. And when the woman of the house would hear company coming, she'd sit a, send the little one out with the broom to beat the mint. <laughs> really? And this would have released the smell of spearmint into the air. I can smell it. I can smell it. And mint was Wonderful. the symbol of hospitality from all the way from Greece that people brought from home to to welcome people to their homes. A beautiful custom. What do you find people most intrigued by when they come to the herb garden here at the Ozark Folk Center? When, when regular visitors come to the park, that is the folks that came to sort of see about the old timey place and the old timey ways come, they in the garden are most taken by the things that are in bloom. It's the flowers that draw them. And then we have the opportunity to explain why that gorgeous plant is useful to humans. When I reach right down and, and pluck a chickweed and eat it, <laughs> or a purslane, I'm just nibble through the garden. And that seems to, to really stop people because it's it doesn't seem right. It causes them to think about maybe the, yeah. their environment, their, their, own, their own garden. What, what's growing out there that I might be able to eat? Yes, that's right. Or that somehow wild food is, uh, is strange and interesting and a little scary. Tina, how did you become so interested in growing herbs? I became interested in growing herbs as a natural progression from being a gardener. And I started gar gardening when I was a small child. When I was in sixth grade, I had my first vegetable garden, and I had to have it. And I was around people in my family who were avid gardeners. When I came to the Ozarks, because I'd fall in love with the rocks and the plants here, 
I answered an ad for a musician and came to this park and found that they needed a gardener desperately. And then I was introduced to the world of herbs because a new herb garden was in progress in this park and I walked right into it. And it was, it was so wonderful to find out that all the plants that I had been raising my entire career were actually useful to human beings besides being beautiful. And they had interesting histories. They surely did. The, the folklore or the ethnobotany of plants is endlessly interesting and I've never been bored in, in 15 years. Does your interest in the folklore of all these herbs continue to grow? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And, and the more we go along, the more we fi find out what people used to do, and also more we're finding out about what we are going to do as a people with plants. When you grow herbs, don't be afraid to use them. Get out in the garden and cut them back. In fact, it helps them. Like basil, in the summer, it just grows like there's no tomorrow. The more you cut it back, the thicker it gets. The same with this golden sage and this lemon thyme. Just cut it back. Now, what I like to do is cut it in the early morning if I'm gonna use it because the essential oils are at their highest. Get a lot of viewer mail and emails about bringing herbs inside at the end of the growing season. You know, during the growing season, you really ought to just have them outside. They do so well because they love full sun. But at the end of the season, if you want to bring them in, it's okay. It's a little tough to get them to grow throughout the entire winter. But hey, if you get three or four weeks of fresh herbs by bringing them in at the end of the season, it's a great thing. Now, if you decide to bring your herbs inside, some things you need to keep in mind. Treat them just like you do your house plants when you bring your house plants in from vacation. You know, they've been outside all summer long. You want to make sure that there are no hitchhikers. Clean them up, make sure there are no dead leaves and so forth. You may even want to repot some of them. But you want to make sure there are no bugs like spider mite or aphids on them. Just give them a good dosing with something that's safe to eat because remember, you're going to be harvesting these herbs. Use a pesticide that's organic so you don't have to worry about you or your children. Now when it comes to light, you need to think about how they perform outside. Most herbs like full sun. So as much light as you can give them indoors, well, that's just going to be better for them. Namely, that's five to six hours of daylight. Also, moisture is important. If the soil dries completely out, then you're setting yourself up for failure. So don't place herbs in front of air vents where they'll dry out so quickly. A window where they can be warmed by the sun will certainly work better. Now, I suggest growing perennial herbs such as rosemary, oregano, mint, garlic chives, and thyme in colorful containers on a tray that can be placed near a windowsill. You know, I had a viewer write in with a very clever idea. She grew basil all winter long, but not huge plants. She would sow the seed throughout the winter and then harvest the little tiny baby plants and use them in her cooking. What a great idea. Now, she's doing this on a small scale, but there are large organic farms that produce lettuce and other greens when they're still immature and they harvest them as microgreens. If you've ever put together a large event with a committee, you know that it can sometimes be challenging, if not exhausting. I recently had an opportunity to interact with Carolyn Newburn, who did a lot of organization for the garden tours during the 2007 International Master Gardener event. Carolyn even put her own garden on tour, and we had an opportunity to visit with her about what makes her garden so unique. Our house is arts and crafts, uh, or the, the period of the house uh, is with the arts and crafts period of the 1920s when the emphasis was on handmade and native materials and native plants, uh, both inside and outside the houses. I grew up around gardeners. My mother and grandmother were both big gardeners and enjoyed gardening very much, uh, working mainly with flowers. When we moved into this house, there was a minimal amount of plant stock. The historic house did have mortared walls and uh, sidewalks. A lot of uh, the architecture, the hardscape was in place and we worked with that and over uh, 20 years, I have added a little bit here, a little bit there. Went through the Master Gardener program in 
four and found out that there was a lot about gardening that I had not learned from my mother and grandmother. And since our house is um, a 1926 house, I've tried to find plants that were appropriate to the period or even earlier and work them into the existing landscape. Uh, things have changed. We had, uh, when we first moved here, there was a child swimming pool, a long narrow swimming pool, which we first had as a fish pond. Uh, it had a number of problems and uh, it has been changed several times. And now we have a raised bed, a bog garden with carnivorous plants and a small fish pond, one that's very easy to take care of. Something that has also become a passion of mine as, as I have gardened a little bit more is just having more fun with the garden and finding things to, that amuse my husband and uh, me and our, uh, our, our family. Uh, my husband is a musician, uh, plays the tuba, so another water feature that we added has a tuba in the fountain. But these things are fun. And I think if, if you don't have fun with gardening, you shouldn't be doing it. So a lot of what I do is fun. Well, we're making some progress and I'm getting more and more excited. The windows are finally going in. And you know what? They've really made this house look different. No longer is it this big cavernous space. The holes are filled with these gorgeous windows and they close and open so easily. Now, these have been designed so that we can take advantage of the outdoors. You know, we're always trying to blur the lines between inside and out. And what you have here is a double hung window so I can pull the upper sash down and get some great ventilation in the house. And you may say, well, so that's great. What about bugs and other things that are outside? Well, we're gonna have traditional screens on the windows and the screening is a copper screen that it's easy to look through. It's gonna look great. Our project architect, Ward Lyle, was on the job site the other day when our window expert, John Kirshner, stopped by to check in on the installation. Let's listen in. Well, John, one of the windows I'm most excited about is this giant guy here. These period window muttons, the nice narrow sight lines are excellent. They fit perfectly with the style of the home. It just works seamlessly with, with everything you're trying to do with the design. Yeah, and then also just from the interior, how you don't have any vinyl sash liner showing, you guys have added this wood filler strip. And also this big fat windowsill is just so period perfect. It gives a lot of dimension yeah. to the window. Provides a great view of your oak tree out front here, so that, that's fantastic. Yes. Well, it's funny you mentioned the big oak tree because the two things that were the inspiration when we first started designing this house were that big tree and trying to center the house on it and have a view of it. And our window from our period house we were using as our inspiration for the style of the house and all the details of the house. So those are the two, the two big driving forces on this project. What sets it apart from a traditional old double hung window? The tilt-in feature. And it's a pretty simple process. You simply open the lock lever, tilt the window in, and allows homeowners easy access to clean the outside mm -hmm. of the window very quickly. Well, John, you can see with gorgeous views like this how important great windows are to the project. <laughs> much this garden has grown. I cannot believe that now it's time to start pulling out the spring vegetables like this broccoli that's already started bolting and begin planting the summer vegetables. It's just been so successful. You know, we're trying to practice every environmentally sound method we can here in this vegetable garden. And really, it's all started with the soil. I like to mix in a good potting soil or source of humus, as well as some well-rotted sterilized manure and sand to help with drainage and then till all this together into raised beds. A good foundation like this will help your plants grow strong, thus making them more disease resistant. But occasionally you're going to have to deal with pests. 
I'm always astonished at just how early the insects get started. Even before that first flush of spring growth is finished, they're hard at work. The method I use is called integrated pest management. Now this is just a fancy term for taking an approach in the beginning that has the lowest impact on the environment and then using more extreme measures as each situation dictates. The first step is to make sure that your plants are planted in areas where they're getting the proper conditions. For instance, you wouldn't plant these ferns in a hot, dry place, or you wouldn't plant many of our favorite garden flowers in wet, boggy soils. This makes them weak and susceptible to insects and other problems. The next thing to do is to try to remove as many insects as you can by hand. Take your kids on a slug hunt and gather them that way, or if you find aphids on your roses, blast them off with a hard spray of water. You can also introduce some beneficial insects to your garden. You'll find that ladybugs love the taste of aphids. If you find that pests are still hanging around, you may want to use an insecticidal soap. Even though this is earth friendly, I never do a wholesale spraying of my garden. Instead, I spray strictly in isolated areas where the problem persists. I use harder chemicals as a last resort, and then again, only in an isolated way. Now, the main thing is to remember to start early. Now, gardeners can certainly employ these techniques in their home gardens relatively easily, but did you know that the integrated pest management is also being used on a large scale in commercial operations? Here in California, we're growing strawberries almost year round, and this crop here, we're growing from spring through fall, and spider mites is one of our key pest problems here in strawberries. Spider mites actually suck the juices out of the leaf material, uh, causing the plant to lose its energy and not produce fruit and subsequently die. Just like it does in our gardens at home. Yep. So here in the strawberries, we're using predatory mites persimilis for control of the spider mites. They actually feed on all stages of the spider mite, controlling them by sucking the juices out of that pest mite. The predatory mites are applied right out of the bottle into the crop, giving even distribution and immediate establishment of the predator. Persimilis has been very successful. It's allowed the grower to cut his chemical costs almost in half and get great establishment in his pest control. But best of all, it's safe for the growers, the, the people in the field, and consumers. Superb. By better understanding the life cycle of pests like spider mites, scientists are learning to deal with problems specifically, all within nature's balance. Now one herb I always grow in my garden, it's not one I can grow from seed, you have to take cuttings from it, is French tarragon, sometimes called the dragon herb because of the fire that it leaves on the end of your tongue, but it's prized by French chefs and it really has an amazing aroma. If you grow this herb, uh, you'll want to take cuttings from it. And when I start plants from cuttings, I simply fill a container with potting soil and leave about a half inch at the top. You want to make sure that the parent plant is pest and disease free before cutting a tip that is about four inches long. Trim off the lower leaves and cut cleanly beneath the leaf joint. Dip the end in rooting hormone and insert your cuttings into the soil. Give your cuttings some water before placing a clear plastic bag around the pot. You may want to hold the bag in place with a rubber band. Now keep the soil moist and check on them regularly. In a few weeks, you should start seeing some roots. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show on herbs. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, herbs are really amazing plants. They're workhorses in the garden. We've seen how they work so beautifully with flowers and vegetables in combination. Hope you've picked up some ideas on how you can use herbs beautifully in your garden home. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. If you couldn't tell, I'm crazy about wildflowers, just wild about them. We're going to compare this year's successes with last year's failures, plus tips on gathering and growing these beauties. We'll visit two inspiring gardens in Europe where they prize our North American natives as much as we do. 
So pull up a chair and join me here at the garden home as we enjoy these beautiful wildflowers. Mm -hmm. 